Um, and I'd like to introduce Jessica. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Jessica Moreno is the Conservation Science Director for the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection. And she's kind enough to uh, give us a little uh, explanation today of uh, the critters that, uh, that live around us. Jessica. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is always so much fun. Uh, and I have to give a little bit of background too because Sun City kind of has the warm place in my heart. When I was uh, a young undergrad at the U of A, one of my first projects with bobcats and, and wireless cameras was there in Sun City um, with some of you folks. So that was, a, that was kind of my start in a lot of my uh, wildlife biology career. Gosh, that, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, nice to come around full circle a little bit here. I'm gonna share my screen with you um, so that you can see this presentation that I have. And yes, that's working just fine. You Thank you. That just fine. Yes. Okay. All right. So today, what we wanted to talk about was the wildlife in your neighborhood. And I wanted to give a little bit of a focus on the wildlife crossing structures that are just next door. Uh, so you not only get to see the photographs and videos that we've been gathering over the last 10 years in your neighborhood, but also what's using those wildlife crossing structures and how they are working. And uh, I will have time at the end for questions and I'll stay as long as we need to to answer questions as well. Um, so keep note of any questions that you may have that I don't cover in the presentation. Um, again, um, I'm Jessica Moreno. I'm the conservation science director for the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection. And if you're not familiar with us, you can find our website at sonorandesert.org and explore a little bit. Um, we're a small but fun little crowd. Um, I hope you join us. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about us. I'm sorry, that went really quick. Let's see. A little bit about us. Uh, we, we got started 20 years ago uh, with the initiation of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, which a lot of our work um, goes around. And we're protecting the biodiversity of the Sonoran Desert here. We use advocacy, education, and collaboration. We're a very collaborative group um, and do a lot of public policy um, advocacy. Uh, so that's how we get our work done. And I, I really like that, that niche that we have um, of working together with people and a across the aisle and with lots of different uh, interest groups um, to save open space and desert for all of us. This is uh, kind of where we're working here in Pima County. This map comes from the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. This is Tono Autumn and possible Yaki lands. And if you look at the map, uh, those green areas are kind of our core biological areas where we have a lot of wildlife living and thriving, mostly in our higher mountain ranges. Um, and you can see that white area where Tucson is and we're so perfectly surrounded by mountains here. And then those um, purple arrows are the wildlife pathways that animals are using to get between those core biological areas. They like to use washes and arroyos um, as we know, but they'll also use open space and ridgelines and, and uh, open desert. And so all of that's very important for wildlife to be able to move between um, mountain ranges, between core protected areas in order to breed, in order to um, adapt to um, fire or drought um, and other stressors. So having connected open spaces are super critical to having a thriving wildlife population. And if we wanna to continue to see deer and bobcats and Havelina and all those fun things um, in our backyards, we need to make sure that they have what they need um, to keep those populations healthy. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and at the coalition, uh, one of our major program areas is wildlife linkages, making sure that these places are connected. And this brings us to this interface of roads, right? So these stars are um, about six of our priority areas right now. And you can see the red stars where we are in Oro Valley and Sun City, where we have the wildlife crossing structures on Oracle Road. 
Um, and we're also doing projects in Vail. We're doing projects um, in, in I-10 near uh, the Tucson Mountains, near Ever Valley Road. We're dealing with the Interstate 11 proposal, um, a wildlife bridge at SR86 near Kitt Peak and, and more. So there's, it's not just this project. This project was the start and we've um, greatly expanded to help connect the landscape for, for wildlife. Here we are. Um, Sun City is not listed on this map, but you can see Saddlebrook there and Oracle Junction and Catalina State Park. That yellow line there is, or the yellow area is the modeled wildlife corridor. So this is where we know a bunch of different kinds of species together are using uh, movement pathways across the cat, to get between the Catalina and the Tortolita Mountains um, and going right through your neighborhood, right? So this is a pretty critical um, wildlife linkage for the state of Arizona, actually, and um, why, why that was one of the places we prioritized building wildlife crossing structures um, where you see those two yellow markers. This is an older map from 2006 showing that wildlife linkage. You can see the uh, red star is where we are, and that's showing not only the link between the Catalinas and the Tortolitas, but then again to the, from the Tortolitas to the Tucson Mountains which is another one that we're focused on, basically um, wrapping around Tucson and uh, connecting those open spaces. And historically, you know, this is places where we've had bighorn sheep moving around um, and potentially could again. So that's pretty exciting too. Back in the day, you know, there's Oracle Road. Some of you around you remember what it looked like before. Um, that's what it was. And wildlife were able to move across that fairly easily uh, with, you know, there were some issues, of course, anytime there's a road intersection, um, but there was plans to expand it from four to six lanes. And with that, we were able to get the funding to build the first wildlife bridge in the Sonoran Desert. Um, these, these structures weren't um, placed arbitrarily. They were placed based on the science that we had gathered on where animals were moving from, uh, GPS collar data on mountain lions and deer, um, and also roadkill surveys that had been done to show where hot spots were, where we knew animals were attempting to cross the road and weren't being able to do that successfully. So projects like this are really a win-win scenario uh, because not only do they help connect uh, populations of wildlife across the landscape, they also help reduce wildlife vehicle collisions, which is a human safety issue um, as well. So in, in terms of the taxpayer cost um, for structures like these, they've shown again and again across the country that they pay for themselves in just a few years when you consider the reduction in costs from vehicle collisions and all that comes with that. So that's, that's pretty cool. This is the wildlife bridge. Um, I think this photograph was taken in March of 2019, maybe, um, before the vegetation really had taken off, but you can see that there from the top. Here's an aerial view of that bridge, and you can really see here, we're looking um, east towards the Catalina Mountains from your neighborhood um, across Big Wash, and that yellow arrow there is the wildlife bridge. Big open spaces that we're connecting here. And then just a mile south of the bridge, it's harder to see, is an underpass. And these two structures were paired and put together uh, for good reason. And I'll, you'll get to see some of that in a little bit. Uh, different animals like to use different types of structures. And so we were accommodating uh, different species by doing that. And then in addition to that, uh, we also have wildlife funnel fencing. So as you're driving along I um, Oracle Road, you may be noticing some of this at, um, fencing along the side. And this is really critical to funnel the animals towards these structures. The animals, of course, don't read the wildlife crossing signs. Um, and even though they're placed where we know animals are trying to move the most, um, there's, if there's nothing to stop them from just crossing the road where they approach the road, they'll do that. So we use wildlife funnel fencing. This is eight feet high and it has a, um, a three foot high mesh at the bottom for the tortoises and snakes and all of that stuff. Um, to keep the animals going where we want them to go. And then over time, they learn, especially some of those 
species like deer that teach generationally their migratory pathways. In 2016, the structures were built and constructed and we had a big open house party, um, invited people up to the top to see what that looks like um, from the structure itself. And you can kind of see Oracle Road underneath there um, and check out the underpass too. Um, and then after that, we officially closed it to the public so that wildlife have free reign to use it whenever they need. Um, and one of the exciting results of this, we kept telling folks, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time, a couple weeks or months for animals to really start using these structures, they're so new. Um, and that wasn't the case for this project, actually. Um, the first animal to use the underpass was a tortoise and it was during construction and construction workers had to stop and help the tortoise go through before they can continue. So that was kind of exciting. Um, but deer started using it right away within a few days and we've just seen an increased uptick of wildlife use ever since. Um, it's been five years now since the structures were built and I think the last tally that Arizona Game and Fish shared was um, just from last December and that was almost nearing um, 13,000 animal crossings to date. We're averaging about two to three thousand crossings a year. Um, so that's really, really um, exciting news that it's working so well. So just to give you a quick overlook at what's using the different structures, um, the animals using them the most are the animals we find in most abundance in this area, which is not that surprising. Uh, what's really exciting is the mule deer. So we have a lot of mule deer using the, the bridge, the overpass. And what, when you look at these numbers, one of the interesting things to take note is that the mule deer really prefer the bridge. They're using the, they use the underpass too, but they're really preferring the bridge. Um, and that was expected. Javelina, coyotes, bobcats, and other animals seem to prefer the underpass. Um, so that's really interesting to see um, how um, mule deer and javelina, for instance, are using different types of structures. And so to help them cross the road safely, uh, we need different types of structures to really facilitate that the best. Um, so that's been interesting to watch. Here's a quick graph that shows the underpass and you can see that mule um, javelina, which is the gray line, um, are using the underpass the most. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of coyote activity and um, some mule deer activity and a little bit of bobcat activity there. And of course there's other species using this, but these are the most abundant animals using the crossings right now. Losing babies, we're seeing lots of baby fitchers. At the bridge, um, mule deer just really like that bridge. <laughs> we're seeing a lot of mule deer using the bridge, which is excellent news. Um, they really do like to have that clear view so they can see what's on either side, they can see where they're going. Um, and that's uh, something typical for, for deer. It is also really nice to see that they are using the underpass. Um, there was There's a, skylight in the median, so they have some light in there and that has helped them use the underpass as well. Some of these deer um, got collared. So you can see these deer in this picture using the bridge have uh, radio, call we call them GPS radio collars on them. Arizona Game and Fish got uh, funding to collar a few animals to see where specific individuals were moving. Um, these collars provide location points um, every few hours so they can get some detailed information. And what they're seeing is really interesting because if you look at this map, every single dot there is a location point for a deer and every color is a different individual. So you can really see how individual deer are moving across our landscape there and how they're really not crossing the road um, except right there at the overpass and underpass. So you can see them crossing between Catalina State Park and into mostly the state lands just north of Sun City. Um, so that's really, really interesting to see um, how they're moving across the landscape there and how some of them move quite a bit <laughs> around and, and, and some don't. So uh, individual preferences there. Then in, in addition to the deer, Arizona Game and Fish also put some uh, not collars, but little GPS backpacks on desert tortoises. Tortoises are notoriously hard to monitor using wildlife cameras. 
Um, our wildlife cameras are heat and motion sensing, and they don't always pick up the little tortoises. So uh, what we did is we put these little backpacks on them. They have an antenna and they take GPS points just like the collars do for the deer and we can track where they're going. Um, we do remove them before they go down for hibernation. Um, and uh, this is what we're seeing with our desert tortoises. So here's all your desert tortoises moving around in your neighborhood. They were able to track about 20 different ind individual tortoises. Um, my understanding is that this year they're going to add some more. So we'll, we'll get some more tortoises in there. And you can see how some of these tortoises just um, keep to a very small area, very small habitat range, we call it. Um, those are likely um, uh, females. And then we have some that just like to bop around um, quite a bit. This one in the red um, is really living and traveling up and down big wash um, all the way from not quite Tangerine Road, but um, Rancho Vistoso Road for sure, all the way up past the church. Um, and that's been really interesting to watch um, those tortoises moving around on the landscape. Thus far, none of the tortoises have used the crossing structures other than that very first one. Um, here's a closer look at where the crossing structures are. And um, this one tortoise here, um, that likes big wash did approach the underpass a number of times and came, but instead of going through the underpass, um, I'll just show, he, he actually went up um, and tried to circumvent it and go across the road and was up in the neighborhood. And I'll show you a picture of, of that in a minute. So then in addition to the um, collaring and, and monitoring the structures themselves, um, Game and Fish did some roadkill surveys to see how this was working. And the interesting thing about this that I want to point out is in this map here, those yellow lines that you see, those are um, the wildlife funnel fencing. And when this, when the project was uh, completed in 2016, we had some problems with places where the wildlife funnel fencing was problematic. Um, it was jurisdictional issues or holdups for various reasons due to utility lines and easements. And so the decision was made that those gaps in the wildlife funnel fencing would be fixed later and we would move forward with the construction project first um, so that the whole project wasn't held up by, by those little um, issues. And so one of the things that the coalition has been working on um, since has been trying to fill in those gaps. All of that funding is coming from the initial the initial funding for the whole project. So it's not extra money. It's from the same pot of money that was um, set aside for this project and budgeted for it. Um, it's just taking a little longer to get in and fix those gaps. And as you can see here, after the structures were built, there still is a little bit of a hot spot between milepost 83 and 82, where the wildlife funnel fencing doesn't exist on the um, west side of the road. <clears throat> mostly small things, but there are things getting in through this neighborhood here. So that was an issue that, that we've been working on. Jessica, uh, yes. if I could have you go back for a moment, this is Don. Yes. Um, uh, what period of time were those uh, mortalities? So these surveys were taken um, in 2018 and 2019. So it was before pandemic, pre-pandemic, um, and they were, their survey seasons were in spring and monsoon when animals are moving the most. Uh, they did driving surveys and walking surveys. So they had people walking along the side of the road as well. Um, and potentially after we get all of the fencing tied up and fixed, we'll be able to go back and show um, what's happened afterwards. What's really good to see are these little cold spots and up here by the wildlife bridge, which is right here next to NMI plus 85, uh, we're not seeing any, any roadkill at all um, up in here around the bridge where we do have the funnel fencing. So that's- Thank that's you. Um, here's a map just showing where we have the wildlife bridge here in the right-hand corner. Um, and you can see that Santa Catalina Church, we've got big wash along the top. And here's the wildlife underpass. And on either side of the wildlife underpass, we have um, those two developments, Rancho, uh, Rancho Vistoso developments, um, the scenic overlook place and Big Wash overlook place. 
Um, and this is where we've been seeing wildlife coming up, approaching the underpass, but then coming up onto the roadway um, through gaps on either end and at the, the roadway entrances around the end, ends of the sound walls. So those gaps, we have been working with the neighbors who live here um, for three years now to try to solve this problem, come up with a solution that everybody would be okay with and, and happy with. Um, you know, the idea of bringing wildlife funnel fencing around the backside of the project of the development was a no-go, of course, you can imagine. Um, and we had talked about putting view fencing in between and things like that. Um, but the solution that we eventually came up with, um, thanks to a lot of collaborative work with residents there, um, is pretty exciting and new for wildlife uh, projects like this across the country. So here's a photograph of the underpass when it was first constructed. And you can see how there's the neighborhood on either side. That tortoise, for instance, would approach the underpass but then come up here and was hanging out in this person's yard a couple times um, and trying to come up onto the roadway. And we've definitely seen with our cameras, um, deer, coyotes, bobcats, um, and other animals approaching uh, Oracle Road. You can see it here in the background. Um, around the around in those gaps on the on the sides too. Um, so we knew it was an issue. And the solution that um, the neighbors and the RTA who's funding the project came up with was basically like a gated community kind of idea. Um, that would be um, a gate, but it's a public access road. So there's no key people can always get in if they approach it. Um, but it will keep wildlife off the road and it kind of makes the neighborhood a little bit nicer and safer for them too. So it was sort of a win-win um, scenario there and ended up actually, even though it sounds expensive to put in two automatic gates there <clears throat> with the brick wall attached to the sound walls, um, it, was, it was, I think actually cheaper than what was budgeted for putting wildlife fencing along the whole uh, big wash. So um, worked out really well. And um, that um, proposal is now in the hands of the HOA um, and they're going through um, all that process um, to get that approval and they can move forward. Oral Valley has taken the lead with um, taking over maintenance with that um, and uh, with, with the funding the RTA is providing. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. And then on the ends uh, where we have the sound wall connected to the wildlife fence that exists there from the original construction, we're just attaching wildlife fence uh, with a cattle guard for emergency access. And that was, that's the solution there to stitch up that end. Um, so, so we're, so it's kind of like a fun project because, you know, you know, it was built, but it wasn't done and we're still working on it. Another part of that project um, that I want to mention too, is that we're also still working on revegetation. Um, it was all reseeded and there was planting done. We're going to go back in again and do some more planting. And I hope that um, coming soon with hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic, there'll be opportunities for volunteers to go out and help us as we go um, put in trees and plants and stuff um, up on that bridge and on the underpass as well. So one of the things that the coalition has been doing this whole time also is monitoring the wildlife in the area. So we are partnering with Arizona Game and Fish, who's been monitoring the wildlife using the structures themselves. And we have wildlife cameras um, in the vicinity, in the area, um, both in Catalina State Park and in Big Wash and um, up into state lands at one point. Um, to see what animals are in the area that aren't using the crossing structures um, and, and what activity patterns and trends we have been seeing uh, before and after construction of the crossing. So this project is entirely powered by community science. We really rely on volunteers who go out there regularly to check the cameras um, and also sort the photos, which now people can do from home. Um, so this has been kind of rewarding. We started this project uh, long before the crossing structures were actually built. So we had a lot of data beforehand um, and we're approaching next year will be our 10 years of data gathering in this in this neighborhood, which is really neat. Um, we're using uh, wildlife cameras also called camera traps. 
that again are, are motion and heat sensing. Some of them take video. And one exciting spin off of this project has been the Critter Cam for Kids program um, in partnership with the Catalina Foothill School District, where students, um, as part of their curriculum, are learning about wildlife linkages in their backyard and the wildlife, the desert wildlife we have, um, and getting to sort some of these wildlife photos as well and help with. Um, looking at the analysis and, and, and what that looks like. So that's been kind of rewarding side project of all of this also, um, uh, connecting it for kids. The data we've been seeing in the area in your neighborhood is really exciting. There's a lot of wildlife out here. Um, a lot of wildlife you don't potentially see because a lot of it's nocturnal. Um, <clears throat> We've been seeing white-nosed kawadi, which come down from the Catalina Mountains. They usually like higher elevations, but we occasionally see them. And we've actually had one use the underpass. We've seen bighorn sheep. We've seen mountain lions on occasion. Um, there's four species of skunks in the Sonoran Desert, and we've seen all four, which is really good news. The smaller uh, mesocarnivores, we call them the smaller carnivores, um, are really good indication of health of an ecosystem. So to see those is good. We've seen Gila monsters, um, desert tortoise, uh, raccoons, white-tailed deer, and mule deer. The white-tailed deer tend to like higher elevations, so it's good to see them down here using the, the crossing structures as well. Um, gray fox, we've seen badgers, lots of badgers. Um, jackrabbits and rabbits are good. You know, those are that's food for a lot of things. You want to see healthy rabbit and, and rat populations for the food chain. Um, Bobcats, javelina, mule deer, coyotes, again, are the most common things that we've been seeing out here. One of the really cool things that we're seeing, too, is this interesting pattern where we started monitoring in 2012. Um, then you can see how um, this is this is mule deer. I'm, I'm sorry. So this graph just shows mule deer activity, and it's showing west and east of Oracle Road on both sides. So the blue line there is west, that's a big wash, and the red line or the orange line is east, that would be in Catalina State Park side. And after the wildlife crossings are built where that dotted line is in May of 2016, there was a huge increase in mule deer activity right there in the vicinity of big wash um, and Catalina State Park as well, where you can see animals, they start to figure it out and at about a year, you know, six months later, they're they're using that crossing structure and it has increased activity of mule deer throughout the whole area, um, which is really good. Um, we're seeing that more movement and that's indicative of mule deer moving not only across the road, but back and forth across the road uh, regularly, which the GPS data from Arizona Game and Fish's Callers later showed as well. Um, so that's really cool. Here's just a graph of one camera, we call it the deer camera, in um, Big Wash. So this is west, just west of the wildlife crossing of a bridge, actually, yeah, the bridge. And um, you can see from when it was placed in 2012 to today, how mule deer activity really went up and increased after the wildlife crossings were built. So it's really good news. We're seeing more animal activity. Um, and that means that we have a connected linkage. We're also um, able to look at um, wildlife activity in relation to each other. So this is kind of an interesting graph. I like to show that red line that peaks right in the middle. That's people. That's human activity. Um, you can see we got a lot of folks out there hiking in the early 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning time. Um, and the animals do the opposite. A lot of them are active at night. So this, this kind of dark blue dot dash line here, these are gray foxes. Gray foxes are very nocturnal. So we're seeing them peak their activity um, at like one or two in the morning. Um, and again, in the afternoon and in, in the evening, uh, late, late, late evening. And then almost no activity during the, the daylight hours. Um, and you can see this dotted line, uh, cottontails, almost, you know, they're, they're kind of shifting a little bit um, uh, more to the daytime, and that's um, also a um, way of avoiding predators. But um, most of these animals that you're seeing are following crepuscular um, habits, which is dawn and dusk activity. So that's when you're going to see animals moving around the most. 
And in fact, we're finding that this is the case with the bridge and underpass too. Um, if you want to catch a glimpse of deer crossing that bridge, but hanging out in that church parking lot or driving underneath, um, the peak um, times are between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. I would say 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning is the peak time for mule deer crossings on that bridge. Um, and then again, they're also crossing a lot between 8 p.m. And, and 12 p.m. at night. Uh, but that biggest peak there is from 5 to 5 to 6 a.m. in the morning. That's when they like to move around nice and cool uh, right at sunrise um, is what we're what we're seeing. And we've, we've seen big corn sheep. This is just next to the wildlife underpass, uh, big corn sheep approaching the wildlife underpass, which is pretty exciting. So all in all, um, with our cameras, um, we've had um, over 200,000 photos over the course of almost a decade, and uh, we've we've monitored 52 sites and seen 62 different species of animals in in your neighborhood in that area. Uh, we currently have about 28 active cameras, um, and Game and Fish has been monitoring for about five years on the structures. Um, and again, they've seen they've seen about 28 species using the structures, and we've gone through that a little bit. Um, that's kind of cool. If folks want to help contribute um, data for what they see, we have a project in iNaturalist. If you're familiar with that or not, I don't know, but iNaturalist.org, we have a project called CSDP Safe Passages. And um, this is an older screenshot, but you can share your observations of wildlife that you see in your backyard. If you want to put up a camera in your backyard or not, or whatever you see. And we're also very interested in seeing um, your sightings of animals as they cross roads or if you see roadkill. Um, that's really useful information as well. So feel free to, to add, add to that. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering to sort wildlife photos, it's a great way to see what's out there <laughs> for sure. Um, you do need a PC. Unfortunately, our system doesn't, doesn't, is not compatible with a Mac or Apple, but um, uh, I would send you a packet of photographs via email and then you would sort through them using our, our this little screen here to identify the species and how many individuals you see and send that back to me and then that helps us run through our analysis really quickly and that's super helpful. Um, this this photograph was taken in Vail. Um, so we've taken this project and used it as kind of a model and we've taken our lessons learned from it as well to other places. So we're looking at wildlife funnel fencing hopefully um, in that stretch near Cienega Creek and Davidson Canyon between, you know, um, Vail and Benson um, and improving some wildlife crossings over there. We're looking at um, crossing structures over near Aver Valley Road on I-10 where the Tucson Mountains and the Tortilla Mountains connect um, and a lot of other projects. So we're really excited to take what we've learned from this project and move forward with, with more good things to keep wildlife happy and thriving in the desert. Um, this is my contact information uh, following up if you have questions later that we don't get to. Um, I really encourage you to join us. If you go to our website, you can sign up for our um, emails. We have a monthly um, desert scoop email that gives updates on what's going on in terms of um, conservation efforts that we're working on and our coalition partners are working on. We've got a monthly volunteer email and then during the pandemic, we started doing these weekly Dose of Desert Joy emails, which I love. They're just like pretty photos and quotes. <laughs> I actually like that. <laughs> so um, you can sign up for that as well. Um, SonoranDesert.org. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have you as a member or a volunteer or just a um, supporter. Uh, we're on social media. You can find us there as well. Um, and there's the bridge. I think like in the long run, you know, one of the questions I get a lot, um, and I guess I didn't cover this specifically, um, but is, is the cost of these structures worth it? And <clears throat> I would say yes. I'm, I'm biased, of course, but I would say yes. Um, the, the crossing structures were both funded by the Regional Transportation Authority, which voters approved in, in 2006. Um, and that included $45 million set aside, dedicated just for wildlife linkages projects. This project, the first bridge um, in the Sonoran Desert with the underpass and the fencing, 
um, was budgeted for $11 million. It actually came in under budget closer to $8 million. Um, and that's including the fencing that we're finishing up now. And that's a lot of money. It sounds like a lot of money. Um, but I think it's important to remember that these are tax dollars that folks specifically voted for and asked for in Pima County. And that, you know, in the long run, it really is going to um, provide a more vibrant and healthy wildlife community for us um, in the Sonoran Desert, both in your backyards, our backyard, but also across a, a larger landscape between the Catalina Mountains and the Torrelita Mountains and beyond. So um, it has a, a really important investment um, that I think is well worth it, Not, notwithstanding the reduction in, in wildlife vehicle collisions that, that we're saving as well. Um, so it's really neat to be able to work on a project like this that you can see and it's tangible, um, you can drive under. Um, and I think that the end of the day when you're talking about what you're gaining from it, um, this photograph was taken in Sun City. <laughs> um, that the choice is not between wild places and people. You know, it's a choice between a richer and impoverished existence for ourselves. And I, I really am excited about this project and have been really happy to work on it and see how um, successful it really has been. Um, we've been able to showcase this nationally and internationally um, as as something that's working and um, pretty exciting. So right in our own backyards. I'm going to stop sharing that. Well, not quite yet. Uh, if, if you would uh, go ahead and put your uh, contact uh, slide uh, about three back, oh, sure. uh, leave it up so for people. I'd well, what I really it. wanted to do too was um, while we answer questions, I can run a slideshow of pictures. Oh. But I'm happy to show that again. I think it, it, it's, it's important that uh, people uh, have time to to write down the contact information. Yeah, here let me let me get that for you again. Great. Uh, also, are will these slides? Uh, are, are these is this slide deck uh, maybe as PDFs? Uh, one that you can uh, uh, send to me so I can post uh, for people to, uh, to access later. That yes, would, absolutely. That would be useful for folks as well. Yeah. And. Um, I'm all going to uh, ask people if they have uh, questions uh, to uh, use the raise hand feature uh, at the bottom of uh, your screen if you're on a computer or elsewhere on uh, uh, on smart devices. I'm not quite sure on each smart device, uh, phone or tablet, uh, where it would show up on your screen. Um, let me, and let me, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna. I'm so gonna. So in case they have questions for you, I'll unmute them. Kind of one at a time, yeah. and um, and and I, I'd like to ask a question or two myself. Uh, are the cattle crossings very effective uh, in in uh, in stopping some of the uh, uh, the wildlife from crossing in certain areas? Are they effective? Um, they are. Um, one of the things about them, though, is that they're built for cattle, of course. Um, which have different behaviors than say deer. So for keeping deer off the road, one of the things that we need to do is um, make the cattle guard actually deeper. Um, so what we do is we usually put two, two of them so that there's a longer jump over to get across. Ah. <laughs> right the cattle over. don't jump as, as <laughs> far know? as the deer, okay. Yeah, they have no problem with um, jumping. So what, we just make it a little bit deeper and wider. One of the reasons that we didn't do cattle guards at the entrances to those neighborhoods, though, for instance, initially, um, was there was a concern about liability and um, uh, with bicycles going across it um, and, and sound, the noise it would cause um, huh. coming in and out of that um, neighborhood. I see, I see that Dina Harris has a, a question. Uh, I think she is, uh, Dina, you're unmuted, so you should be able to be heard. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering um, where the un overpass and underpass is on Oracle Road. What is their water source? That's a good question. Um, so there actually isn't a water source there at the crossing structures. Uh, one of the things um, that's important to remember with the crossing structures themselves is that we don't really consider them habitat by themselves. There are gonna be temporary roads, just like you use to get to the grocery store. 
So animals aren't really living there or, or existing there um, unless it's a rodent or something. Um, they're just passing through. And one of the great things about this area that gives us so much wildlife is that we do have water sources nearby. Um, Catalina State Park has water sources and then in big wash um, and in backyards. So you'll see you'll see your bobcats and stuff coming up to drink at your bird fountains and pools and things like that. Um, and animals know where their water is. And one of the interesting things you'll see too is that in um, the summertime before the monsoons hit, when it's really, really dry, there's less wildlife movement. And that's generally because it's hot. And so they're moving more at night, but they're also sticking closer to the water sources that they have available. And they're not moving as far from them. And then once the monsoons hit, we get a lot of wildlife activity, a lot of movement back and forth. And that's because there's water freely available and they can, they can easily find it. They can travel further, um, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Does that answer your question, thank Dina? You. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'll go ahead and, and mute you. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, I see Dave Goodman has raised his hand and is unmuted as well. Yes, hi. I'm, I'm just wondering if the, the prey have, have learned that, or rather the predators have learned that prey are going to be using those crossings or do they just camp out nearby and wait for the uh, prey to stroll by? Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I do get that one a lot, actually. And what we found, um, and there's been studies done on this, actually. Um, what we found is that not really. Um, and again, it's because it's an area that's not um, prime habitat. Um, and, and so most of the animals using it are just using it to pass through. It's not a comfortable place. You know, there's, there's a lot of traffic underneath. There's a lot of noise. There's housing or uh, um, um, parking lots nearby. Um, so it's not a really comfortable place to hang out for a long period of time. So that's, um, I guess that's why the, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's why the, the uh, mule deer prefer the overpass instead of the underpass because they yes, have a better exactly. uh, view of uh, potential predators. Yes, they can, they can keep an eye out um, uh, to see what's, what's coming because they're gonna be nervous about it and more alert about it. Um, we, we did have a concern about hawks up on the telephone poles on either side of the bridge and just sitting there and just getting whatever little rabbit <laughs> run across. We actually haven't seen that happen yet. Um, it's true that um, animals learn. And so, um, for instance, a mountain lion will have a, a favorite meal and they'll get really good at hunting javelina, for instance, and figure out where the best spots are and they, they go there and they do that regularly. Um, and so it's possible that something like that could find a crossing structure and figure out, you know, hey, there's animals coming through. But because the animal, the deer and the prey animals are so hyper vigilant in those areas, um, their success is lower. And again, they know they know where to get their food, you know, uh, much easier in other places. So for whatever reason, we really haven't observed a lot of that activity happening at the crossing structures. So Christy Lewis has a question for you. Sure. Hi, hi Jessica, thank you. Um, I wondered what the smallest animal that you've seen um, on the cameras are, and what about pack rats? Are there enough to quantify them, like more or less than the rabbits, for instance? Yeah, um, we, well, so, when you set up a wildlife camera, the way you aim it and set it up kind of biases you towards certain animals or not. Um, so you have to be kind of careful about that. And most of our cameras are set to get medium sized and larger animals in the view. Uh, we do see pack rats on occasion, but I don't set the cameras low enough to really get a lot of that consistently. So we see them, um, but I haven't, done, I haven't done the project in a way to like really compare specifically how many are there versus rabbits. We just know that they're out and about. I would say the smallest animal, well, it's kind of cheating. The smallest animal is a spider that lives in the camera and they just crawl in front of the lens. <laughs> um, we've also seen hummingbirds um, and mice occasionally, but it's pretty rare we see that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. If anybody else has a question, please uh, use the raise hand feature and oops. I'm gonna oh, share this, hang on. I'm sorry. I'm going to okay. play this while we're going. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, turn off the, the audio if you would. 
It's got music in the background. I'll yeah, can you off. turn off the music in the background so while we're doing this? So that'd be good. Here, hang on. Uh, oh, I have I have a question. Yeah, just one 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 sec. We'll get this. Make sure the music in the background is not getting in your way. Oh, go right ahead. On. Go ahead, right ahead with your I'm question. I'm sorry. Hang on. I accidentally muted. Yeah. Oh, uh, I didn't mean to do that. Sarah, mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay, several years ago, the uh, Community Assistance Committee here in Sun City gave your organization some money to buy some cameras to record some of the crossings through the wash, et cetera. Are those still being utilized? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? The crossing. I said several years ago, the CAC, the Community Assistance Committee here in Sun City gave your organization some money to buy some cameras to record the animals going back and forth in the watches. Yeah. Are some of those still being utilized? Yes, actually they are, yes. Um, and you know, I, I came on board here three years ago. So I'll have to go back and find out which cameras those are, but I would happy to, I'd be happy to share back a report once I figure that out <laughs> of what those particular cameras have shown us. Uh, no, that's that's not necessary. I just wondered if they were still being used. Yes, they are still being used. Good. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to turn off the music for that so it's not so loud. And um, it seems I can't do that without muting everybody. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that's not too loud. I think we can talk over it. So uh, uh, Alan Mashburn uh, has a uh, question. Go yes, I, I appreciate the uh, information that you presented today. And my question is during the Catalina fire, was the underpass and overpass utilized more? And then if it was, how soon did it go back to normal? So um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my sound. Um, it sounds like you were asking about the fire, the Bighorn fire, is that right? Yes, that, that's correct, and how it impacted the usage. Okay, um, it might, I'm sorry, it might be easier for me to just talk to you guys instead of share this thing and share this. I thing. think, I think that's right. <laughs> so let's do that, um, let's just talk. Okay, so the Bighorn fire, yeah. It was really interesting to be able to see from our camera data and also from the wildlife bridge and underpass data what the response was from the Bighorn fire, which came fairly close um, to the crossing structures. Um, a little scary there for a minute. You could see it, you know, burning so close to the highway. Actually, what we found from the data was that the deer just kept moving around like they normally did. We didn't see an increase in deer activity and we didn't see a decrease. It was the same. I can't explain it, <laughs> but that's what happened. Um, Arizona Game and Fish actually puts out a six a biannual report on their data, which you can find on our website. And the last one that they put out in December, they specifically called out the Bighorn Fire, um, showed maps of how close it got to the structures um, but they, but they were like, yeah, the, the data didn't show any particular um, difference in activity, not significant difference in activity um, from the fire. So the deer just kept using the bridge. Any That's other part, uh, folks that uh, want to ask a question, please uh, use the raise hand feature. We'll get you in. If in the meantime, I have a couple other questions. Uh, um, you have counts uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, numbers of crossings uh, by species you know, during different periods of time. Is there any ability to uh, uh, determine how many of these are unique individuals as opposed to the same individual crossing back and forth? Uh, for example, the same individual deer? Yeah, uh, it's really hard for deer. Um, with bobcats, you can go in and look at spot patterns and identify individuals if you want to take the time. Um, badgers, too, you can identify by individuals. 
Um, with deer, it's hard. We do know with deer though, because some individuals are collared where those ones are moving. So I can tell you that we know animals are using the crushing structures more than once going back and forth. And those deer, um, there were two male deer in particular that were using the crossing structure, the bridge, um, two or three times a week going back and forth. Uh, so we know that that there, some individuals are using it quite frequently. You know, whenever um, they ran out of beer, I guess. Is right. And I think, you know, it depends too on the animal. Um, some animals like the deer and the coyotes and the bobcats, they, they, this is their home and they're living in here and in this neighborhood. And they're, they're considering Catalina State Park as like an extension of that home now that they can access it easily um, and vice versa. So, um, so we are gonna see some of those species moving around and, and a lot more frequently. The infrequent crossers that we're excited to see will be when we start to see mountain lions using it um, or black bear, because those are species or bighorn sheep. Those are species that live mostly in the higher elevations, not mountain lion, but, but mostly in the higher elevations. And when they're crossing, they're not crossing because they're coming to get groceries and come back. They're crossing to go to the Tortolita Mountains and find a new home. They're going to go find a new mate. Um, and that's uh, really another really important part of why we want these structures is not just for the everyday traffic, but also for the once in a lifetime movements that some of these animals will make. Is there any uh, opinion as to the impact that the uh, dogs and uh, humans uh, using these underpasses and overpasses might have on the use by the wild animals? Yeah, um, we have data on that from other crossing structures that have built in other places. And in some other places of the world, actually, um, they've also built wildlife bridges that included uh, pedestrian walkways or bicycle paths to accommodate um, uh, people. There's a, there's a new wildlife bridge being built in Texas, for instance, that's connecting two different parks. And they're, um, they're including a, a pedestrian um, pathway with that. And it's, it's um, <coughs> They try to isolate the two using, you know, uh, vegetation or, or a wall or something. But so, is we, there a negative impact of, of the use by, uh, by uh, domestic uh, animals as well as uh, humans? Yeah, when we when we see people or dogs or horse horseback riders, um, the animals aren't present. So, anytime a person's using it or present there, the animals are not. Um, and because it's such a constrained small space, your any human presence. Or, or dog presence on the structures themselves mean the animals aren't using it during that time, um, which is why we close these ones to the public. Um, I mean, mean, people still via go down. signage. Is that is that the way you have it? The ones we have uh, close yeah. to the public. Okay. Yeah. And you'll you'll notice too um, if you've been watching the big the big. Um, like a year ago, they, they moved the trail or they built a trail, a multi-use trail in Big Wash. And uh, that was sort of new and, and surprising to us. And we had to jump in really quick and say, okay, wait, you have to move this further back. Um, we didn't like the idea that it was in Big Wash so close to those crossing structures, but uh, it happened too quickly for us to nix that um, or have any sway on that. Uh, we were able to get them to move the, the, the trail further um, west away from the crossing structures. They, they were trying to connect it into the underpass. And we were like, nope, it's not access to County State Parks. You can't do that. <laughs> um, so we do, we do see, you know, animals, they know how to avoid people. You can tell from the activity patterns that they tend to just avoid it when people are out um, during the day. Um, and so, uh, and we've got video of, you know, coyotes walking up a trail and then moving off to the right, right as a bike comes. Um, so they're out there <laughs> just avoiding us. Yeah. It looks like we don't have any other folks raising their hands uh, to ask questions. So uh, if, if there's nothing else that you want to add, I'll go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point uh, sure. and make it available later. Uh, 
via YouTube and also the Sun City website. And I'll uh, make sure you get a copy of the links to those, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much Thank for you. this uh, fascinating information and look forward to the uh, slide deck as a PDF so we can share it directly with uh, both the folks who uh, listened on this call and any others uh, yeah. uh, who weren't able to join us today. I'm also happy to share the slideshow that I didn't I didn't share at the end because it got too confusing with me. I've done That'd that. Be great. I don't know why the sound I couldn't turn the sound on the video off, um, so that folks can just explore enjoy. that. Yeah, we would enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you so you much. All. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.